Jensen, turn to Colossians chapter 2. One of the characteristics of human nature is that we sometimes think we can improve on the Word of God. I know we wouldn't admit to that, but that's how we act sometimes. And I'm told the Jews of biblical times were very adept at adding their own thoughts to the law. Of course, they had the Torah, they had the Law of Moses, but they also had what was called the Talmud. The Talmud was the oral interpretation of the law. The Talmud had two parts, the Mishnah and the Gerama. No, Gemara. That's right. The Mishnah was the interpretation of the Talmud. And the Gemara were commandments based on the interpretation of the Talmud, which is in itself an interpretation of the law. Then they had the Halakha, which was laws based on the interpretations found in the Mishnah and the Gemara. And finally, they had the Haggadah, which were the anecdotes and parables illustrating the laws based on the interpretation of the Mishnah and Gemara, which were an interpretation of the Talmud, which was an oral interpretation of the law. All right, so that's, that's how they lived out their faith, supposedly. In modern times, that'd be likening it to uh, a sermon, and then a commentary on the sermon, and then laws based on the commentary on the sermon, and then some illustrations, and all of these are binding on you. Can you see why the Lord Jesus spoke to the Jews of his day and said, you have nullified the word of God with your commandments and traditions? And yet, we find that danger even in Paul's day and coming down to our day of adding our own thoughts to the word of God. Now, it would be bad enough to go back to the Jewish laws, and that's what he had addressed in the last part of this section. If you notice in verse 16 of chapter 2, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. And you can see why those from the Jewish perspective would be judging these new Gentile believers because they weren't to be doing all of those things. These are just a shadow, Paul says. They were just a picture, but the reality, the body, the substance is of Christ. It would be one thing to go back under the law, and we're told not to do that. We are not under law, but under grace. But there was another problem Paul addresses in the section for today, and that is people that were going back to worldly ordinances and laws. And so he's going to talk about that. And what it boils down to is that in this passage, we're going to be looking at some of the dangers and the doctrines and the decoys of man-made religion. And you'll find it here in Colossians, you'll find it still today. So let's begin with the dangers of man-made religion. We find that in verses 18 and 19. Verse 18, let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up, by his fleshly mind. Now, Paul has been warning us throughout this text. You might remember back in verse 8, where he says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit and so forth. Spoil you means to rob you of something. Well, there's something that you can be robbed of in verse 18 as well. And I find it very fascinating that Paul is very specific, obviously, he's writing by inspiration, and so he uses just the right words. He says, let no man beguile you of your reward. Now that's important, because, and it's comforting, because no one can ever rob us of our salvation. If you put your trust in Christ, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit under the day of redemption, 
Nothing can separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, as Paul talks about in Romans 8, and there are many other passages that talk about our eternal security in Christ. That's if you're saved. Once you're saved, you're always saved. But you still can lose out on something even as a believer, and that's what he's talking about here. Now, what is it you can lose out on according to verse 18? Your reward. Your reward. And the Bible has much to say about rewards. It's kind of interesting. Paul uses sort of a, a big Greek word here, a kata brabuo, and a, brab, a brabus was an umpire or a judge. And what he's talking about, his point is, when you follow man's religion, you are letting someone else make a judgment on you, and the result can be that you lose out on a reward. And really what he's saying is if you're, if you're uh, altering your behavior based on other people's judgment of you, not on your relationship with the Lord, you're potentially missing out on future rewards. One of the beautiful things of the Christian life is that we get to determine by the grace of God our own rewards. They're there for the taking. Over in 1 Corinthians 3, and I know you know this passage well, I'm just going to read a couple of verses over there. 1 Corinthians 3, Paul talks about the rewards that are coming for those who are building upon the correct foundation and building in the proper way. Uh, verse number 12 says, Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. Notice how carefully, again, Paul is in the choice of his wording. Uh, you might read that passage and say, wait a minute, I thought we weren't saved by works. We're not. He's not talking about salvation here. He's very specifically talking about reward. Verse 14, if any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Well, what if I didn't do anything for the Lord, or I didn't serve him as I should? Well, verse 15, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So what he's saying is, uh, you may live your life as a believer, and never serve the Lord as you should, you're still saved, but you won't have any reward. Now, um, that would be unfortunate, but at least you'd be in heaven. Okay, so the, <laughs> the most important thing is you want to make sure you've, you've put your faith and trust in the finished work of Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. But at that point then, don't be letting people who judge you draw you away from the path God would have you to walk. Verse Back to our verse uh, in chapter 2, Colossians 2, 18. Let no man beguile you of your reward. And then he's going to give some current illustrations. By that I mean current in his day. I suppose there are still people who would fall into these categories. But he says, first of all, uh, in a voluntary humility and worshiping, of angels. Now, why would someone who would call themselves a Christian worship angels? Well, one of the teachings that was popular in Paul's day, we've talked about it many times, was Gnosticism. And uh, one of their teachings was that God is holy and man and material things are wicked, and so you can't ever have any connection. And so they would teach that God did not directly create us, but that he created angels, and there were intermediate layers, but they created other beings, and finally it got down to some angels created man. That was just the teaching that, that they had to try and separate the holiness of God from the, the wickedness of the flesh. And uh, Paul has already dealt with that in dealing with creation. He says Christ is the creator of everything, back there in chapter 1. And then in verse uh, chapter 2, verse 9, he says, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead 
bodily. So not only did Christ create everything, he himself took on human flesh as the perfect son of God. So when he says, don't let anyone beguile you of your reward by worshiping angels, he's talking about those who had bought into this false idea that some intermediary angels actually created man. Now the next logical step would be, uh, whoever created you would be worthy of worship, right? I mean, that's kind of the logic that they took. And so they would begin to worship angels. And he says in verse 18, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Now, what that's referring to is that Paul is simply saying these Gnostics claim to know things that they could not have possibly seen. They were teaching this false doctrine about angels and angel worship, and Paul says, you know, they're intruding into an area that they really don't know anything about, and so you shouldn't be listening to them. Now, I think there's a lot of ways we could apply this passage. I think that a lot of Christians have a real fascination with angels. Maybe they aren't to the point of worshiping them, but they'll often talk about, well, my guardian angel did this and did that. And, um, you know, I would recommend you really do a study on angels from a dispensational perspective. And you'll find that in this dispensation, uh, Paul doesn't teach us about guardian angels. Now, I think Paul had one. Uh, or at least a messenger appeared to him when he was on his trip to Rome. He says an angel appeared to him and told him everybody's going to be okay. So God was still working with angels in that way at, uh, at that time. But in this dispensation of grace, we have the indwelling Holy Spirit. Now tell me, if we have the Holy Spirit, who needs an angel? All right. Um, so that's a fascinating study. So uh, don't be putting angels up on a pedestal like many people do. And certainly do not worship them. It would violate the command of God to worship no one but him. Uh, angels themselves, that is good angels, forbid worship of them. The book of Revelation, chapter 22, we won't turn there. Uh, verses 8 and 9 talks about that. An angel will not receive worship. A true good angel, now a, a demon probably, and the devil, be glad to have you worship them. But a, a, an angel of God who is faithful to God will not receive worship. And, of course, it infringes on the very person and position of Christ if you're going to start worshiping angels. So, again, he's saying that will only rob you of your reward if you would enter into that kind of worship. But there's also a present loss, not only a future loss of reward. Look at verse 19. And not holding the head. And capital H, you'll notice there, referring to Christ. Not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increaseth with the increase of God. To worship angels is to miss the doctrine of headship. We are not to be <coughs> worshiping angels, praying to angels, uh, hoping that angels are taking care of us you're really then attributing things that belong to Christ to a lesser being. And you're not really holding up that head of the body as you should. And why should we hold up Christ, the head of the body? Well, because it's from the head that all the body, by joints and bands, having nourishment, is ministered to. In other words... You get all of your spiritual sustenance from Christ, just like you get, where do you get your, yeah, I know when you go to the hospital, you can get in, you know, uh, intravenous, but uh, under normal conditions, where does all your sustenance come from? It comes through your head, right? It goes in your mouth, you know, and you swallow it, and then it helps your whole body. And he's simply using that illustration of the, the body to show us that we need to remember where our spiritual sustenance comes from. It doesn't come from angels. It comes from the head, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to hold him up. And, you know, I think we need to hear that message. Uh, sometimes even in the grace movement, we're, we're accused of, oh, you're, you're holding Paul up there, like he's almost a, a second Christ. No, Paul himself said, I'm less than the least of all saints. 
He simply was the apostle, the messenger that brought the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. We exalt Christ. He is the head of the body. And you know, when you understand right division of scripture, you understand Christ even better than you did before. And um, let's not miss out on the beauty of what Christ means to each and every one of us. Uh, we get nourishment from the head. We get the unity by joints and bands he's talking about. That refers in the physical body to the, the ligaments and everything that holds you all together. And that comes from the head. That comes from Christ. Um, and he is the, the source of all of our well-being. Now, we're going to go on and talk about a second aspect Paul brings out. That is the doctrines of man-made religion. And we find those in verses 20 through 22. What are some of the doctrines that were current in Paul's day? And we even have remnants of those uh, hanging around yet today. Well, it starts in verse 20 by saying, Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world... What does that mean? Well, Paul introduces here another uh, very important doctrine, and it's one that is part and parcel of the message that was committed to Paul. And that is that when we put our faith in Christ, we become identified with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. And so when we become a believer, we are now dead with him. We, and now, why is that so important? You know, that seems kind of morbid to some to think, well, we're, we're dead with Christ. But what he's talking about is the fact that we are dead to our previous life. We are dead to the world. We're crucified with Christ. We now have a new life in him. And it, it's not only a practical illustration, but it is actually a, a, a technically like a legal illustration. Uh, when someone in the natural world is in deep trouble. They've committed terrible sin or crime or theft or murder. But if they die, the law can no longer touch them. They don't, they don't bring the corpse into court and, you know, have a jury trial. And, oh, they, he did that. All that's done. And that's sort of the illustration that the Bible uses for when you put your faith in Christ. You're, you're dead. To the law you're dead to the world you're you're dead to that previous life and because of that you now live a new life in Christ so when he says in verse 20 if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world in other words you're not obligated to the world's standards anymore you have a new standard in Christ a new life and what it was particularly he was pointing to was the rudiments of the world and we're going to see what those are here in a moment. And then he says, why, based on the fact that we're dead with Christ, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances? Now again, he's pointing to a common problem of his day. Uh, also, we, 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 th we know it as asceticism. Asceticism was that teaching that if you're gonna really be holy, you can't be involved in anything that brings too much pleasure. And they carried it to, to foods and so forth. He gives some examples in verse 21. Touch not, taste not, handle not. And um, they would apply it to marriage. The Corinthians were starting to buy into it. If you read chapter 7, he talks about that. There were those who were married, and they were coming to the conclusion that they shouldn't even touch their wife. And Paul said, no, 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 you've got this all wrong. Um, if you're married, uh, it's good to touch your wife. That's God's plan for you. You're one flesh. But uh, they were carrying it that far. Um, they, were, they believed they shouldn't have any physical pleasure. They, they shouldn't eat things that are pleasurable to eat. And um, that was sort of their motto, touch not, taste not, handle not. Paul's comment on that is in verse 22. He says, which all are to perish with the using. And what he's talking about there is the fact that... Um, after you eat something, it really doesn't harm your soul on the way through, and it perishes with the using. <laughs> it's gone. Um, there are people that seem to think that 
if they eat or don't eat certain things, it's going to affect their soul or their spiritual relationship with God. And Paul is simply pointing out what you eat isn't affecting your relationship with God. Now, um, I, I know people that are, are health conscious uh, sometimes get to the point where they feel that people who aren't eating you know, healthy uh, are really harming themselves spiritually in some way. And I heard a, uh, a tape once, that tells you how long ago it was, cassette tape. <laughs> and uh, this, it was a doctor, a Christian doctor. And he said, I can tell you right now, uh, eating the wrong foods won't keep you out of heaven. In fact, they might help you get there sooner. <laughs> um, so yeah, there may be physical consequences to eating the wrong foods, but if you have put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and you're saved by grace through faith, what you eat is not affecting your, your soul. That, that's just, and, and that's what he's talking about here, which are all to perish with the using. And where's the source of all of this stuff? Verse 22, after the commandments, and doctrines of men. That's where this stuff comes from. And it's kind of interesting here. <clears throat> you know, not only are there these kinds of doctrines, oh, you've got to eat this way, or, and so forth. This has found its way into many churches. There are many doctrines of men in churches that people think they have to follow in order to be right with God, spiritually speaking. Um, a, a huge example, and this has kind of fallen by the wayside because of a change at the top, but for many years, uh, it was illegal for Roman Catholics to eat fish, or to eat meat on Friday. That's so they would order fish, right? They'd eat fish. If you go back in history, do you know why the church had decreed that you eat fish on Fridays? Anybody know why they did that? It was to help support the fishing industry that had fallen on hard times. And so if you're the Pope and you know you got millions of people following you, you can fix the fishing industry in, in, in just one simple decree, hey, everybody eats fish on Friday. And I mean, growing up going to public school, uh, the, the Catholic kids, you know, they would, they would prepare fish on Friday at school to make sure that they could eat their fish on Friday. Now, um, I, I understand that um, the Catholic Church did remove that, that requirement years ago. But how many people do you know still eat fish on Friday? Because it's still ingrained in their mind that this is one of those doctrines I've got, <laughs> I've got to be faithful, you know. Um, there's the commandments and doctrines of men. And you know, I could just spend hours talking about the commandments and doctrines of men that churches impose on people, and they have no idea why. Um, but they think, they go, oh, they got to do it. Well, Paul's going to summarize how these things are really nothing but a decoy of man-made religion. We find that in verse 23. Which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. You might wonder, well, what draws people to these doctrines and commandments of men? Because as much as we hopefully recognize that, that these things aren't based on the Bible many times, people still go after them in droves. Why do people like the doctrines and commandments of men? And I believe Paul identifies at least three areas that draws people to these kinds of things. Number one is intellectualism. Again, look at verse 23. Which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship. A show of wisdom. Uh, this phrase literally means a reputation of wisdom. Uh, many people choose a church based on the reputation it has. I've known of several communities that I've lived near where 
there, there's that certain church in town and that's where the kind of the upper crust goes, right? That's, that's their, their intellectual place where they worship. Um, and there's a, they, there's a show of wisdom in will worship. What is will worship? Will worship is I'm, I'm going by the sheer force of my will. I'm going to do these things by my own power. That's will worship. And, you know, sometimes people involved in will worship, uh, I think of them maybe as uh, legalists, are very well-behaved, upstanding citizens, and they often look better than a lot of our Christian friends do, and even ourselves, right? Because they've determined. But, you know, if that's the only reason we're worshiping is to make this show that, well, we, you know, it's like Christ when he taught about the Pharisees. He said, don't be like the Pharisee that stands on the corner, you know, and prays this big, mighty prayer. Christ's comment was, they have their reward. In other words, that's all the reward they're getting. Everybody, oh, what a beautiful prayer. We'll worship. Another reason people are drawn to this kind of human doctrines and commandments is because of a false humility. Look at it. Uh, a show of wisdom in will worship and humility. And what you're saying is, you know, I'm... In, in this, this doctrine of worshiping angels, they, they were saying, well, you know, I'm not really good enough to approach God, and, and so that's why I pray to these angels, and I worship the angels. I don't, I don't want to trouble God with poor little old me. You know, God's big enough and loving enough to pay attention to each and every one of us. Um, I, I've honestly, I've heard of you know, good sister Christians that will say, well, you know, I'm not going to give my prayer request because God's got better things to do. That's false humility. God loves nothing more than to hear from you and to find out what you want and what you need. He might not give it to you, but he still wants to know what's on your heart. False humility. But a third reason that the these decoys of human doctrines and commandments are so appealing is that they appeal to the flesh. Look at verse 23. And neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. And so again, if, if your reason for uh, denying yourself certain pleasures is because you can show how strong you are in the flesh, that man, I denied the flesh. Look how I overcame. And Paul says, you know, that's, uh, that's not the right reason, appealing to the flesh. Now, I kind of, kind of find this fascinating, that these three decoys are nothing new. They come out of the same old bag of tricks that the devil has used all along. Uh, in 1 John 2.16, uh, John writes about the... Uh, lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And these are the methods that Satan has used literally from the beginning. Remember when Eve was tempted, he said, if you, if you eat of this, well, first of all, this, uh, this fruit, that's good for food, right? This forbidden fruit, it's good for food. Lust of the flesh. And uh, if you eat it, you'll be like God, pride of life. And uh, you, will, you will have greater wisdom. It looks good, lust of the eyes. It tastes good, flesh, pride of life. These are the same things the Lord was tempted with by Satan when uh, the devil took him out in the wilderness and, and tempted him. Um, Look at that, those stones, he could turn those into bread. Christ was hungry, hadn't eaten for 40 days. Lust of the flesh. If you uh, worship me, look at all of these nations, all these kind of, I'll give you all of these nations. I always thought that was kind of a goofy offer. Christ is gonna have all the nations someday anyway. He's gonna be the king of the whole earth. But um, kind of like getting ahead of the program and saying, hey, you can have all this, I'll give this all to you now. And uh, there's the lust of the eyes. He showed him all those things. and. Take you up to the pinnacle of the temple and cast yourself off. The angels will swoop in and, and just gently take you down. Pride of life. Look how good you'll look. Um, 
Satan, you know, he's not real creative, but he doesn't have to be because the old, same old temptations still work. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. And that's what is going on here. Um, a show of wisdom in will worship. Pride of life. Um, and humility in the neglecting of the body, not any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. Um, lust of the flesh. False humility. All of these things are simply a part of Satan's <laughs> Temptations that he's used all along. Well, Paul really nails all of these issues head on and really brings us to a turning point. And, and I'm so excited a couple of weeks, Lord willing, we get into chapter three because true to Paul's form, he spends that first half of a, a book typically laying out these doctrines, laying out the truth so that we can see where we're headed. And then he takes the, the truths, and in the second half, he starts showing how you apply what he's taught. And, and, and we'll hit that in chapter 3, verse 1. If you then be risen with Christ. And he, he starts to show how these things apply to us. Well, we're going to stop with that. We hope you're not involved in uh, false humility and worshiping angels and all of these things, but that you're beholding the head and holding him up first in your life. Let's pray, shall we? Father, thank you for these scriptures, which have so many applications for us today. Even though Paul was addressing things that he was dealing with in his current society, we might have different names for these things, but as we've seen, they're really the same old story. And so, Father, I pray that we might hold up Christ, the head, as our only source of, uh, of um, spiritual life, as our only um, object of worship, and that our faith would be a sincere faith, not an outward show, as these that Paul talks about were so, so proud of. Lord, thank you for the truth that is revealed in Scripture. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.